32 of the biggest darting stars on the planet, including world number one Michael Van Gerwen, former Grand Prix champion Daryl Gurney, plus fan favourite Peter Wright. Get your tickets now at Ticketmaster.ie and search darts. The 2019 Boyle Sports World Grand Prix Darts at City West. Game on. OTB Sports Radio. Just All right, welcome back. So we're going to get ready and, and go again. How you doing, Nathan? I'm all right now. Good half-time break. I think I got through half of the first page of things we were going to talk <laughs> about tonight. Um, we are going to give away a prize at the end of this section. Cadbury have been very generous. Yeah, you'll get to go to the Premier League game of your choice and uh, flights as well. And that will come up in, what, 45 minutes' time, give or take. Yeah, we are here tonight with thanks to Cadbury, celebrating our third year's official snack partner to the Premier League. And as we mentioned before, it's a big night for us because all the money raised here is going to AWARE, who are Cadbury Ireland's charity partner. So check out aware.e. It's going to raise a huge amount of money. So again, if we don't get a chance later on, thank you all so much for coming out. Hopefully you're enjoying it. And uh, yeah, let's get started with the second yeah, half. Yeah, they've been brilliant guests so far. Roy Keane, Gary Neville, everyone. <laughs> Give nice Gary the chant in. again, come on. <laughs> uh, let's jump straight in. Are you enjoying punditry? Is it something that you suspect you're going to do for a long time, Gary? Um, I don't think I'll do it for a long time. I think that, I feel like seven years now, I think, um, unless you evolve, essentially, you just lose touch with the game a little bit and you just feel like you've said the same things over and over again. And I do quite a lot of it. I'm on sort of like 40, 50 times a year. Yeah. Um, I think commentary is okay in the sense that every game is different, but in terms of incidents that you see on the pitch that you discuss in the studio, there's only so, so many certain types of incidents that you can see. There's only certain types of, you know, your position on each thing each season is the same. So if you've got a position on diving or if you've got a position on VAR, it's the same season in season out. It doesn't essentially change. And I feel like I'm getting to that moment now where within the next two or three years, I'll have to evolve or essentially just, you know, do something different. I just feel, I feel like that, you know, I did Monday Night Football for four or five years, now I, now I don't do it every week um, through my own choice. I just said, you know, I've done enough. You know, yeah. I think, you know, now Cara does it. So I think I was conscious that, you know, staying too long doing something, I think that for me, I feel like at the moment, like I need to change right. in terms of what I do. Right. Um, that's, that's a fascinating thing that you say you lose touch with the game. Like, you... <sighs> You, do, you don't lose touch with what you're seeing, but just sometimes what's happening in the changing room. You know, obviously, you know, Roy was in a changing room last season. I've not been in a changing room now for three seasons. If you're not in a changing room, you do lose touch with the changing room. You do lose touch with the coaching. And I just feel that I'm more now qualified maybe to speak about other things in football than I am about actually sometimes on the pitch. I feel like in terms of... I, I, I'm not developing my tactical knowledge or my understanding of the game. Yeah. I'm, my knowledge is my knowledge and it's not improving. Maybe I'm understanding a lot more about dealing with agents or dealing with club issues and sort of finances and stuff like that because of Salford. So I'm improving in some areas, but I just feel if I'm commenting on football games then I'll have to change and evolve in the next few years because I, I won't go back into a changing room, obviously. <laughs> Who do you like watching as a pundit? Um, you can say Gary. <laughs> no, I, you know, I tolerate Gary, obviously. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't really listen to too many of them. Um, yeah, you know, Gary's not bad. Uh, Graham Sooners, I think, is decent. Um, uh, no, 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 no. Listen, and, and, and that's it. Literally, look, you've obviously spoken about punditry before. That maybe you felt you were better than it. That you had more to give to the game. Yeah, and do. you know what people would look at it, that there's a contradiction then when you rock up in Sky. Yeah, but I am a contradiction, so it's no problem. No, I, uh, <laughs> I agree with Gary there, but I, um, I kind of do the TV so, sometimes because I don't want to do it, if that makes sense. Sometimes you have to go and <laughs> get out of the comfort zone. I could be sitting at home. Again, I miss the dressing room. I love the dressing room. I love being involved. Whatever about, whatever about the game, or, like, with the Irish job, loved all that. That was brilliant to floor the job. Uh, when the games came around, working with brilliant players like Seamus Coleman, etc. So when I do the TV, it's just a case of, again, doing something different, different experience of um, away from, from football. But 
when people talk about my punditry, I think I've done two games in the last year. For, don't think for one second, I've, I've been doing loads of games or living in the studio. I, I, I think I've enjoyed, obviously, been involved in football in Nottingham Forest the last few months. But every now and again, I will, particularly when I'm not working, will dip into the TV because you have to keep yourself busy, um, whether it be with Sky or IT. And I also like watching games of football. You know, when I was with, with, obviously working with Martin, with Ireland, a lot of my a lot of my trips and journeys to watch players was in the championship. You know, listen, that can get on your nerves as well. The championships, championship is not great. So I, when I get a chance to do the TV, for example, if I do United game or Liverpool, I like watching good teams. So there's a selfish side of it. Go, let's go and do a bit of TV work and watch a decent game. <laughs> What's the problem with that? Yeah. Fairly straightforward. Yeah. So why not do more of it? Because you're clearly good no, I at probably, it. No, I probably will over the next few months because I'm not working. And obviously I've got bills to pay. So yeah, I'll be, uh, <laughs> I'll be on every week. No, I, I also don't want to do too much of it. I, I'd hate to be kind of labelled a kind of TV pundit, particularly when I'm looking to get back into management. But if companies get in touch with you, I've obviously, I've, I've kind of always enjoyed working for ITV. Um, so I've kind of got a, a kind of bit of a loyalty towards them when they ask me. And obviously, then Sky is good to watch Premiership matches, um, particularly if it's United, as I said, Chelsea, live at Man City, or uh, again, a selfish point of view, it's nice to watch decent matches. So I, I definitely will do more games over the next few months. But in, obviously, in the back of my mind, obviously, I still want to try and get back into becoming a manager. I, I, th I think on punditry, I, 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 you know, I hear what Roy's saying, and to be fair, I agree with him, because you always feel like you're on the outside of the game, essentially, and that the managers and the coaches are always, sorry, the managers and the players are always the most important people. But when you think about being a pundit and you think about the fact that to be a pundit on Premier League games in England, there's about seven pundits, two or three on BT, three or four on Sky. Out of all the ex-players that have finished in the last 30, 40 years that could be it, there's only six or seven are actually going to be regularly on Premier League games. So in the sense that, you know, Roy obviously could do Premier League games, he could do international games because he's compelling on television. You know, I'm at Sky, I've been there for seven years. We can dismiss the sort of, oh, it's just punditry, because the fact of the matter is we played United for a long time, we think that was the most important thing, and obviously being a manager is the more important, all the rest of it. But everybody would want to do what we're doing, you know, everyone would want to do what we're doing after finishing a, a, you know, a, a football career, which is going on television. There's only six, seven people. How are thousands and thousands of players do Premier League football matches in, in England. So you have to be pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Rob, it's, honestly, I know it sounds crazy. The idea that you can actually articulate a message to, to millions of fans, make them understand what you know, you've seen in a way which is you know, good to them and they enjoy it. I, it's, it's not easy. I've seen really good coaches really good managers, brilliant managers and players. Everyone says, oh, it's easy to be a pundit. But I say brilliant managers and players, coaches, do interviews, come and do punditry, and they're not very good at it. Yeah. So I think we can sort of say that punditry is easy. Or it, it, I don't think it is that easy. It, be, it may becomes easy to what, because we, we're comfortable, we're at United, we're at, we, you know, Roy talks about that Middlesbrough game just before we went off. Essentially, if we lost a match it, on MUTV of that time, it would be me or Roy, essentially, maybe one other that would do the game that we lost in. You'd be put up as the senior player because we were capable of basically dealing with you know, that type of defeat or if an interview after a game where we lost yeah. a match, it wasn't, you, know, you wouldn't put other players up. So we were doing that for United. So actually, punditry does come in some ways more simple. Same with England. Yeah. If England lost a game in a tournament, I would always speak because I felt comfortable. I had no problem with it. So I think that it's not easy to be a pundit. I think, you know, you're, it, it, there's not a lot of people do it and a lot of people who, to be fair, don't do it very well. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I don't think I said it was easy. Well, my point was that, no, I, th I think it is hard. I think it is hard. And that's why you get out of your own comfort zone and go, listen, if, if it makes you a little bit nervous, then I think that's a good thing as well. Try and do something a bit different to what you normally do. There's nothing wrong with that. I think Josie's doing it at the moment. I think Josie, since he left United, has travelled to watch different types of football. I think he's gone in the television studio with Sky, because I think if you remember towards the end at Sky, 
Josie became quite critical of pundits, got quite involved with them. It was almost like he was, you know, yeah. at war with pundits. And I think he basically, you know, he said something just before the first show that he did a few weeks ago that he felt like he wanted to come in and understand it from sort of that other side. Because I was a manager for a very short period of time. <laughs> and it can, it can get you paranoid that when you, people say things about you, you believe it's personal, you yeah, think yeah. they're after you, you think that fucking everyone hates you, you think that there's people basically enjoying you're suffering. I never really, you know, there was never, I never a point where you sat in a studio where you're critical of somebody and you think, I'm really enjoying criticising. It doesn't really, I mean, there might be some people who have that character about them, but I, I genuinely never feel like that. Mm. Um, are, are you done with management in your own yeah. head now? Done. Done. I, I, to be honest with you, I, I never should have said yes to the job. I wasn't qualified to do the job. I didn't wake up every single day and think about coaching from the minute that I finished playing football. I had far too much stuff. And I was, you know, I was doing the Sky stuff. I was writing an article for a newspaper. I was doing all the stuff in Manchester that I was doing with you know, Salford and other things. You know, managers have got to be 100. It's about commitment. We talked about commitment before, you know, as a player. Why, it's, absolutely, it's, it's more important as a coach that you're committed, that you think about it, that you're sort of, you know, immersed in what you're doing every single day. And I wasn't. I, 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 other than the time that I went to work with England, which was essentially sort of maybe 10 days every month. I wasn't thinking about coaching. I wasn't on the training field every day doing sessions. I wasn't in a club every single day doing things. I had no right to be a successful coach. It was actually, to be fair, in some ways, it was one, obviously because of Peter owning Valencia and him investing in the projects in Manchester and Salford. I felt partly that I did it because you know, he asked me to do it and as part of an elite, not allegiance, but like a loyalty that I said, okay, I'll do it. And partly a little bit of, my contract with England was coming to the end five months. Partly my Sky contract was coming to the, con uh, to the end after five months. Partly a bit of selfishness in terms of, oh, let's give it a go type thing, I'll five months, what can I lose? I don't feel I lost anything, even though people would, level, you know, people would throw at me all the time. Um, but I made massive mistakes. There were simple mistakes, you know, not getting rid of players that weren't committed, that wanted to leave the club. You know, I was a 40-year-old 40 40 English person who didn't speak the language, didn't understand the league, didn't understand the players, didn't understand Valencia, all the rest of the things. And, and surrounding myself by three coaches who, again, were young and didn't understand those things. Three of us didn't, out of the four didn't speak uh, Spanish. Yeah. It's just nonsense decisions, to be fair. So I made massive mistakes. Um, and I'd sat there on television, to be fair, judging you know, players and systems and all the rest of it for two or three years, but got to the point where I actually lost my confidence for about the last, we'll say, six weeks of the job, to the point where I was like a spinning top. Didn't honestly, which, which player shall I pick, which system shall I play, you know, all over the place. And I have to say from that point of view, it was through the bad decisions that I made, but I should have said no to the job. I should never have taken the job. And I plan everything in my life, yeah. everything. You know, what I'm doing this year, what I'm gonna think and do in the next three years, what I'm having for tea tomorrow night, and the instinctive decisions that I've made, opening a nightclub, opening a restaurant in Manchester, taking the Valencia job, they've all failed. Three or four, every single one, every time I've made an instinctive decision that's not got thought, that's not got thought, that's a little bit sort of ego driven, that oh, of course I can do it, failed. Right. And it's a, le it's a lesson, it's a massive lesson. Those things have happened to me in the last two or three years, but I'm fine for it in terms of, you know, it's a good thing. I feel like it's a good thing for me now. Cause, so the idea of will I go back into management now, how, why would I? There are thousands and hundreds and thousands of coaches who are thinking about their job every single minute of every day, and Gary Neville just rocks up tomorrow and says, yeah, I'll be a coach. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Management is obviously a brutal business, Roy, and Gary's proof positive of that. And like what you've been through your management career from the unbelievable success the first year in Sunderland. Like, these things never end well. Like, we think of that moment with Ireland in Lille and nothing can ever get better and still it doesn't end well. Like, do you ever think the way Gary, like, Gary's thinking, it's just not worth the hassle? Or have you some sort of, are you addicted to management? Oh, I wouldn't say I'm addicted to management, but I, I definitely want to have another crack off it, you know, from, um, whatever the time it is, Sunderland, which is brilliant, Ipswich, obviously there's some positives there, obviously le left on a disappointment, loved the stuff with Ireland, um, enjoyed a few months with Forrest, even with Martin, but I, I definitely want to have another go off it, um, but I also live in the real world, 
you know, I don't think Real Madrid will be calling me. You know, I, I, I think I've got to weigh all that up. And unless it's the right opportunity, in the meantime, I'll just back away from it and see what comes up. But um, yeah, hopefully with something come up, because there's something, well, it's, 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 it's in my makeup at this moment in time, that I, I definitely want another crack off it and, and, and see where it takes us. You haven't really spoken, I don't think, about the end with Ireland since it finished. How did you find out, yourself and Martin O'Neill, that you were well, going to lose uh, your yeah, job? Yeah, listen, you, you, you know these things. On the last game over the weekend when we were away, um, listen, you hear stuff. You kind of, I always say you kind of smell stuff. You, um, you just sense something's coming. But again, I've, all this idea of losing your job and the sack and finish, all that stuff doesn't frighten me. That, that's part of the industry we're in. I, like, any time I've even lost my job or I've left a job, I've never been that upset. I've just thought, well, you know, listen, sometimes you might be a bit angry, upset by it if you think you've been badly treated. Uh, Martin and myself with the Irish job, I loved every minute of it. Uh, and again, instead of kind of going, oh, I think we probably deserve, I, well, I do think we deserved another crack off it, but we had some brilliant years. And strange enough, people still said to me, oh, sorry, it kind of didn't work out with Ireland. And I go, well, well, it did. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it, well, we had two proper campaigns. We qualified. Okay, we got to a playoff. And you're t I think if every Irish manager had done that, Irish football would be in a, de a decent place. Towards the end, when you're losing one or two players, um, and whatever about myself, I, I definitely, there's no doubt my, my Martin was harshly treated. There's no, there's no doubt about that. But obviously when there's a lot of negativity, a lot of spin out there, and, and also I knew when, when, when our, kind of, our wages were, were, were eventually, uh, when Dennis O'Brien stopped paying our wages, I said it to Martin at the time, I went, as soon as we hit any sort of sticky patch now, we'll be definitely be gone. And when we were missing the players we were, trust me, and I've watched Irish football since I was a kid, Ireland are going to hit a sticky patch because there's real lack of quality at the moment. Never mind if you're missing Seamus or Robbie Brady, one or two important players, you're thinking, we are up against it. So when we had that sticky patch, you're hoping that people will stick with you. But nine times out of ten, people will panic and they will make a decision that you might think is unfair. But that, again, I kind of keep repeating myself, but that's, that's life, that's the industry we're in. But the stuff we had with Ireland, and I still miss the Irish job, I loved it. I loved the buzz of the games, the players. Um, I love working with Martin. I think Martin, brilliant manager, a really good guy. Um, went some great days. Jesus, I've been very fortunate in my career, but the, 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 the one or two games you've mentioned there were up there with all, a lot of the highlights in my career, especially when it's your country. It was brilliant, the trips we had. Does that surprise you? Because I, I, I think I've heard you saying before that like, it's all about playing, that the joy is in the playing, that actually having the night of Robbie Brady's Golden Leal can actually match. Yeah, but I had to make a conscious joy. decision even when I came back. And obviously, Martin, obviously, after my kind of dealings with Ireland, um, so when I came, I kind of was a bit of a conscious decision in my head to go and listen, try and enjoy these, the good days a bit more. Because when I was a player, certainly, and you are in the zone and you're focused and there's pressure and you're, yeah, listen, it is hard. It is hard to kind of, kind of let yourself go. And because of my makeup and personality, I was, I kind of had to keep a front up anyway because I was this kind of machine or whatever you want to call it. So when we were to Ireland and we had the good days, Jesus, they were brilliant. Like the Bosnia, these games, Germany, a Martin, Martin, a good guy with the staff. Uh, Jesus, very lucky. I, I don't look back at any sort of regret and go, yeah. But I, I, again, I honestly think we should have been kept on for another campaign. But again, I think with the wages situation we now see with the FEI, I knew we'd be under the cosh when the FEI were carrying Again, I don't know Martin's contract, but I know I was on a good deal. That any sort of chance to say it. No, I was. Listen, I'm on a, I was on a good deal, Jesus. <laughs> Rightly so. I am. Um, <laughs> you, um, you're under the cosh. And towards the end with the games, we were struggling with, we couldn't score a goal. We're not daft. You know, I, 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 a lot of my friends, obviously, into soccer, and they would say to us, oh, I was tough last night. Was, you didn't play well. You go, I know, I was watching it. You know, <laughs> you know I'm watching the same games as the fans. We're not, we're not thinking, you're not seeing. But uh, I think what uh, it irritated me towards you when people said, I still thought the players were giving everything. I, I didn't feel for one minute going, I think we've lost the group. We were losing, players were injured, and because this was a new campaign, we were trying young players. And people should have had the same attitude as us. We all want to win football matches, but Ireland at the time, we said, we just have to take our medicine. We just have to get through the next few months. Yeah. 
until the proper World Cup campaign starts because basically we signed our contracts to stay on for that. Yeah. But we were there for that weekend and listen, you hear things. And I think Martin was harshly treated. Of course, I think that. But we'll survive. We're, we're, we're big boys. Life goes on. It's, it's the name of the game. You mentioned the, the, the kind of noise around it. Have they lost the dressing room was one of the things kind of in the ether. And then also one of the other things, Roy, it'd be good to get Absolutely. your take on. I, I was, have to say it. Well, actually, go on that first then, sorry. Yeah, yeah. of course. No, you're dead right. But, I, but you, th that's always the talk anyway. We, listen, we see with other managers, a manager loses his job. Listen, if you're not winning football matches, you're going to put yourself under pressure. I, I get that, of course. But this idea, I think the one thing that kept us going, actually, I always felt with Ireland, and even when I played, people always thought the Irish spirit is great. And, we keep, and that can only take you so far, you know, in certain sure. games. And, top international matches, you need quality. And, and every game, and even go back to when I played, everything was a chore for Ireland because we listen to whatever way we play, we don't keep the ball well enough, blah, blah, blah. That's, a, that's another long story. But the drive and the spirit can only keep you going so far. But I think the Irish players, as I said, when we left the Irish, when we left the job, I, I, I had no bitterness towards the players going, oh, they're down tools in yeah. us, they didn't try. Our last game was, I think, Denmark away, and we drew nil it. If anything, the players were unbelievable. After the game, I was delighted with the players. Were we delighted with the quality? No, and we rode our luck. But we rode our luck in games that we won. We beat Germany here. I guarantee if Germany scored the first goal, they probably beat us by 10, you know. Fucking, but we stayed in the game and we got a goal. We got an eight, an eight, a late equaliser in Germany. Brilliant. Players were fighting the cause. But like I said, you then you lose with Ireland. It's not as if, if you lose one. It's maybe England, certain countries can carry a few losses. With Ireland, you lose... One, two important players, sure. you're up against it. And, and, and the bigger picture for Ireland, and it's a big concern for everyone, is the players now who aren't playing in the Premier League, who aren't playing for any of the big teams. Ultimately, when you play international football, that does catch up with you. Now, Ireland can still overachieve, and they might, they've had a decent after this campaign, and there's not, it wouldn't surprise me if they won tomorrow night. But when you keep going, eventually you will kind of hit a brick wall when a few players are missing, yeah. and your lack of quality will go against you. But the players, I couldn't. And I know there was stuff towards the end about me supposed to have words with players. You have words with players all the time. That's the name of the game as well. My job, again, when I went with Martin, it was not to be this, this quiet guy in the background. And people would say, why would I do the media? And so, because Martin would ask me. Martin would say, would you do the press conference today? I've done it the last three days. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. No, if they said never again, do the media. I go, no problem. It's no big deal. Certainly not an ego trip for that. But the players certainly, I felt, gave it their all. And, um, and I, I really couldn't fault them. Was there one or two towards the end? And when you've been with players for a number of years and because there was a shortage of players, I did feel some of the medical staff were probably pandering to some of the players. That would irritate me. Okay. You know, when you're speaking to players who aren't injured, who didn't want to train, who... who uh, there's a new trend, and not, just, not the Irish, but there's a new trend amongst footballers at clubs now. I had a little bit of Forest, and particularly one or two with Ireland. They're on a programme, you know, and their programme is they don't play and they don't train. It's great. So they turn, up, they turn up for Ireland and you go, but you're, you're, you're actually, you're, you're, the medical staff said you're fit to train. Yeah, but I'm going to do something back in the gym or I'm going to have a dip in the pool. But would, would you not train? I don't know. Would you put your boots on and just get involved in the 9v9 or 10v10. So that bit at the end, but everything, the usual stuff, then people go run into the media, the all of pals in the media, everything as usual is exaggerated or a pack of lies. But I look back at, I look back at the time I had with Martin in Ireland I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. It was a brilliant job. I got great job satisfaction. Yeah. And, I, and, and I, was, I was proud to be involved with them. But, as I said, we move on. I, th I thought the picture was fantastic. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was a couple yeah. of lollipops away from being a cracker. <laughs> 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 Their arms were just there, weren't they? <laughs> But that was, yeah, the, the picture of the, 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 the after Italian game. Yeah. That's brilliant. Are you, are you, there you go. A, just all it needs. Just... <laughs> Do you, I, know I you don't said, know if that's Mance. Who's that hand on my head? <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. But football can bring you back down to earth. Because after the game, listen, it was brilliant. And we thought we'd lost it, I think, when Wes missed a chance. Yeah. And the atmosphere, brilliant. Listen, obviously fantastic. And I had that as a player as well in America. Brilliant. But then people drag you back down. Because I remember after the game, we're going back. And there's a bit of a sing-song. Lads having a few pints, of course. And I remember Ollie texted me, Solskjaer. One or two people would get hold of my number, unfortunately. And he would text me. <laughs> And he said, great result. I remember reading the thing, and he went, it's always great when you beat the Italian reserves. And I went, thank you, oh. you bastard. <laughs> Didn't know me. Uh, yeah. And there we are thinking, Ollie's a good guy, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> Dragging us down.
Because obviously the Italians made a few changes. They'd already qualified, but that was brilliant. Do you, do you class Martin as a friend? Yeah, brilliant. brilliant man. Really a lot of time for Martin. <laughs> but no, brilliant guy. A lot yeah. of time for Martin. Honestly, the, you know, in, in the industry we're in, and, and it's, I'm sure the same for you, there's a bit of, you know, doggy dog and everyone looking after themselves and surviving in the game. I get all that. But I found Martin, even when things at the award the end, he'd fight your corner for your contracts. And I don't mean mean, I mean for like Seamus and Gups and people like that. Right. Um, no, I have a lot of time for Martin, and again, I, I, I think the treatment of Martin towards the end um, by a lot of the sections from the Irish media it was obviously certainly personal, whatever you say, and uh, it, it was nasty, because he's a good guy, yeah. and there's not many good guys left in football, let me tell you. And he very much obviously fought your corner as well in those last couple of months when there were those issues, which... Look, everyone's heard the Stephen Ward WhatsApp about the Harry Arthur and John Walters issue. Oh, yeah. Like, do you want me to get started on that? <laughs> well, it's a, it's, a it's a lovely story. <laughs> like, when you hear that, you go, fair enough, that's what happened. I don't think it was an issue. Well, I just, don't see why you'd think well, it was an issue. Well, put it this way. When I have issues with any players, uh, again, I don't even think Wardy was there. But no, I, he wasn't. No, but, but I give an example of what, when you're working with certain players who are playing at a certain level. John, I think John Walters for the last two or three years, because I know he's on the circuit now, isn't he? He's a, he's a good talker, John. He, um, John hadn't kicked the ball for the last two or three years, but does a lot of talking. It's amazing. Imagine if he had a good career. But he's still uh, in the squad. Harry Arthur's now, obviously, was a Cardiff, went on loan there, got relegated. Wardy. I don't think Wardy can get... Wardy can get in the Stoke team at the moment. Stoke were bottom of the league. So, I don't know. Maybe he had a point. I don't know. Would you, would you class them as friends? <laughs> Does any part of it, though, when you look at, say, so John Walters is in that camp and he's in that situation where at club level he doesn't really have to train, his body can't take training, comes into Ireland camp, that's related to the medical staff there again, he can do one session out of three, that, that's kind of modern football and that you may have to change your ways? No. No, honestly, that is nonsense. This is the danger of the game. Don't get me started on John. I tell you, I've worked with John. John Walters. Talk's a good game. Imagine if he had a good CV. Imagine if he won a trophy. Well, he went on to have a good career as a professional. Sorry? He went on to have a good but career as a professional. He done okay. He done okay. And the games he was fit for with Ireland, he done well, I have to say. But towards the end, when players are turning up, and creating stuff. Do me a favor. <laughs> so you're defending John. Do you know John well? Have no, you, we've have John, you, have John you worked, has, have you worked John with has him? done some work with us, yeah. Have you? Oh, I bet he has, yeah. <laughs> but as you say, he... <laughs> like you talk about that Bosnia night. John Walters was the one who scored the goals. Well, yeah, yeah. How many years ago was that? So is he going to live off that? Like a certain player scored against Holland. You live off that for the next 20, 30 years. <laughs> Listen, I know all about John Walters. I know all about him. Are you going to tell us? I... <laughs> Bluffer. Again, talks a good game. And then there's the circuit, of course. There's all the circuit stuff. Goes on the TV, how, how harshly he was treated by me. He's crying on the TV. Family situation. Uh, there's just, he's the only one who's... Don't. Do me a favour. <laughs> Not kick the ball for Burnley for two or three years. I used to be driving the train, he'd be on the radio. You know what I mean? Why don't you lay low for a while? Lay low, take it easy. Sorry, Look at his medals. Oh, that wouldn't take long, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't we? Couldn't wait to get out of Ipswich when I was the manager, making all sorts of demands. Ironically, two or three years ago, when his career was in free fall and he had injuries, he went back to Ipswich on loan. Fantastic. I was laughing my head off. <laughs> laughing my head off. You missed the game. We, we get beaten at Wales. John played. Didn't have a good game. Wardy played. 
they need to go back and watch some of these games back, remind themselves how bad they were. Um, John misses the game, I think we go to Turkey, he speaks to Martin, he needs to rest for the game, because Ipswich are playing Hull away, mighty Hull, and uh, <laughs> misses the game with Ireland, and guess what, Ipswich got beaten up a Hull. And I think that might have been one of the last games John had, because again, whatever program he was on, wasn't working. Because <laughs> he finished with a knee problem, two years early. <laughs> Will you be seeing John soon? I have no idea. Probably not now, I suspect. Oh. I saw my best to him. I'll be sure. Well, he promised to pay me a visit at my house a few years ago, and I'm still waiting. And I gave him the address. <laughs> Good old John. You said, you said there about the next step and a return to management that... For who? For, for you and... Oh, this, from who said this? No, you were saying just there about oh, right. potentially returning and you're not waiting for... You're not waiting for... You said this. Yeah, yeah. You're not wait, expecting a call from Real Madrid anytime soon. Well, you never know. Gary Ole got Gunnar a call from Valencia. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer got the call. <laughs> <laughs> Ole Gunnar Solskjaer got the call from, uh, from Manchester yeah, yeah. United. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, did course. part of you think... You know what? No, no, Maybe. no. I, 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 listen, that was never going to happen. Not with, um, I think there's somebody still in the background there having a say. I, um, no, that was brilliant for Ali. And again, in sport, we got, you need a, a bit of luck, a bit of timing. And it was brilliant for Ali. So, uh, would it be the same with Lampard? I think goes into Chelsea at the right time. Neil Lennon goes back to Celtic. You need a few breaks in this game. And maybe I get an opportunity I don't think I feel I'm going to get. So, please God, something might come up. Do you, do you intend on going out on your own now? Or would you go back in somewhere with Martin? No, no, I know. I think obviously after the, in fairness, me and Martin discussed it many times when I was at Ireland. The role suited me in international football, and we both agreed even before Martin went up the forest that we probably wouldn't it wouldn't suit me being assistant at club level. So when I went up the forest, the plan was again my contract would have sorted out that I'd probably just go up there till the summer just to try it. Yeah. But I knew if I go back in the club, it's got to be the manager. Simple as that. But I had obviously a bit of loyalty towards Martin. Um, I didn't think Martin would go so quickly after I left, but I knew after kind of a month or two that the, 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 the assistant manager's role at club level uh, didn't really suit me. It was fine with Ireland, that was no problem, because obviously you're not together every day, etc. But the club stuff, no, I, I definitely would have to go back in and, and, and be a manager. And do you, you know, you talk about the modern dressing room and all this kind of stuff. Do you feel like you have to hold your tongue as, when you go back in? Do you feel like you have to adapt what, the way you'd like to manage, the things you'd like no, to say no, to I'm players? In, no, but I'm intrigued by people who talk about my role in the dressing room, particularly people who've never been in the dressing room with me. It's amazing what mm. people think I do in the dressing room. Yeah. You know, I, I, I usually kill three people a week. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'd be the perception. No, I'm... Yeah. Bel I'm fairly placid in the dressing room, trust me. Huh? This image is hard to shake it off, I know. Um, <laughs> but you ask any of the players who work me for a long time, even the lads of Sunderland who were there for a year or two, honestly, quite relaxed. Even my time at Ipswich, people kind of almost write me off because of that. But listen, there was pluses at Ipswich. I think they're okay, every, it's slightly different all with Ireland, but enjoy that. But I, do I, this might surprise you though. Have I made mistakes? Yeah, of course I have. Sure. And Gary was on about there, whatever industry you're learning, you're trying to obviously become better at it. But I don't think I need to move it so far away from what my, I suppose, my traits are, because my traits have taught me so far. But do I have to improve in certain aspects of my management skills? Absolutely. Mm. And I've made mistakes. And, but hopefully I'll learn from them. Um, strange enough, I'll probably make lots of more mistakes. But again, don't think for one second, when I'm working with players in the dressing room or on the training pitch, obviously Gary made, I'm, I'm actually quite, believe it or not, relaxed when I'm working with players. Do I put demands on them? Of course I do, but I feel like, it's kind of got to the stage where people say to me, you know, I was very demanding. As if I should almost apologize for it, you know? Particularly when I'm in the coaching role, when people say, oh, the modern players don't like that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not doing it all the time. If, if you're doing that every day, if, if Alex Ferguson didn't do that every day, people talk about the hairdryer, you just try and get the timing right, when to have a go at players, whether at the time people thought I was having a go at John Walters or Harry Hart. You're trying to, sometimes you're trying to motivate people and sometimes you're motivating them. Sometimes you get it wrong. Some players enjoy that, they go, yeah, you, you know, I enjoyed, I enjoyed that uh, 
heated discussion, whatever you might say. But again, obviously you've got to pick and choose. But other players react to it. You go, oh, I think you're, again, you've got to be John and Harry at the time. Or obviously Wardy wasn't in there. Yeah, you know, maybe the issue's you, lads. Because I, I sometimes would step back and go, did, 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 I, did I get that drastically wrong with a situation at Sunderland maybe, at, a, at Ipswich? And I go, maybe I did, maybe I did. But other things, maybe, maybe they got it wrong. Maybe they overreacted. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when managers that I go, me, Brian Clough, these are great managers. Brian Clough, you're on about more of it. Brian Clough, and it's well documented, punched me after a game one night with Crystal Palace in the cup. I know it's loud and it's funny. Brian Clough was a genius. Did I take it that badly off him? I just went, no. He was upset, he was heated, and he punched me. But I remember thinking, yeah, I still think you're a brilliant manager. And I came. <laughs> I came in the next day and I trained and I didn't text anyone in the media or ring somebody or go on WhatsApp or Twitter, whatever they go on. I said, somebody punched me. I just went, the manager's upset. You take it, you, you take it. The players, you take it. So I'm not changing my ways for nobody. Okay, yeah. And if... But I'm learning, I'm learning. WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah. WhatsApp. What's WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Are you... Um, are you like bored around the house? Are you no, itching no. to get back in? Like if, if, if a job didn't come, no, what would the know, next 10, 20 I've years be? I've been very lucky. I'm, I'm definitely, I got, when I analyze my career, I've been the, I'm one of the luckiest guys on the planet. And I never get bored. I ne I'm, I'm never at home going, I've always got something to do. Obviously, if, you know, uh, five children keeps you busy. I've got my couple of dogs, my wife. I get a few little bits of work, but I'm never bored. I always keep myself busy. I go and see somebody or yeah. I come back to Ireland quite a bit, down to Cork watch matches, I go to Croke Park, I, watch, I like watching rugby. Never get bored, I'm very lucky in my life, honestly, I have no complaints. Would and uh, this idea, I, w I need to get back in the game because yeah. I might go stir crazy. No, 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 would I'm you, fine. Would you ever move back to Ireland? Does that help? Yeah, you? yeah, I think so. I think, I, I literally have that thought, I think every single day. Really? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, all, it's always there. Um, but I have to look at the bigger picture. Obviously, I've got my family, but they're growing up now and, um, yeah, I think there's not a day that goes by where I don't think, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll eventually get back to Ireland, of course. I know like, you've had an amazing time over in England, obviously. Is there ever a certain sadness when you think, geez, my age now, I spent more of my life away from home than at home? Yeah, like, there is that. Missing yeah, out yeah. Stuff. I, I think, well, obviously, when you get a bit older, people talk about getting homesick. You get, I get homesick every day, back for, particularly for Cork. Yeah, it's really strange. So, yeah, there, but I also know that f football in England's given me a great life, and it's given my family a great life, and, mm. and my family in Cork. So I count my blessings for that. And I'm also only around the corner. It's not as if I'm in Australia. So I can get back to Cork. I like, I do over the last, particularly the last few months, I suppose when I'm kind of not working full, I love, I love coming back on the, the boat. I have a bit of freedom. I answer to nobody. You're on about TV. I can kind of dip into the TV, dip back out of it. And Jesus, honestly, I'm, I, I count my blessing. I'm very, very lucky. Content. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> Would you not laugh? That's a dangerous word to use. Yeah, you, you always fight that off, contentment no, I'm, uh, the, the comfort zone. No, yeah, no, but I'm obviously worried about, get, you know, I don't want to get in the comfort zone either where you think life's great and I just sit back and not do anything. You do have to keep yourself busy. As I said, I look at certain games, look at certain clubs where I think, yeah, I think that club would suit me or whatever it might be. I don't, I don't sit around hoping for managers to lose their jobs. I don't. Yeah. Um, but there are certain clubs I look at, I, go, I, think that, I think I'd fancy maybe doing something with that group of players. But I also have to, be, again, I go back to it. I might never get back, I might never get a job opportunity be because okay? when jobs come up, I very rarely, well, never get linked with jobs. Mm. So it's not as if I'm, I don't think clubs or chairman or chief executives out there have got me at the top of their list. But what I would like to do, I suppose, sometimes is get an opportunity to speak to a club, even if they don't give me the job. I've yeah. been interviewed for jobs over the last few years and they've gone with somebody else and that's fine. But you want to get a chance to try and sell yourself and look somebody in the eye and, um, and obviously do well in the interview. So yeah. I, Hopefully I'll get that opportunity in a few months, but I'm not fearful of it either. If it doesn't happen, I'll, I'll be fine. Is the Ireland job still an ambition? Um, uh, who knows? The, the danger for me now, people talk about, the, listen, it's, it's unfair, because no matter what I say about the Irish job or the Irish situation, it's unfair on obviously Mick at the moment or the manager and Robbie, the people that leave, leave them, get on with it, I had a good crack off it, and, um, and let them see how they're doing, good luck to them. And, um, but if that ever came back around, who knows where I am in the pecking order, funnier things have happened, but we'll see.
It's obviously set up for the next few years with Mick McCarthy now and then this rather unusual succession plan where yeah. Stephen Kenny is coming in. One of many unusual things that have happened in Irish football over the past year. Yeah, but that's just year. the way it is. Yeah, and yeah. Listen, let's see how that pans out. You know, it might, might work out really well. Who knows? Again, again, one thing I don't think any of us can do in here is predict the future. We, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with results or our own careers. Um, so, again, I don't go to bed every night thinking, you know, I hope that job comes up or the Irish job comes up. Good luck to people and see how they're doing the job. And if they win football matches, they'll be fine. And if they don't, they'd all obviously be under pressure like everybody else. Have you followed what's going on in the FAI? Um, do you know what? Not really. I, my only, I, I suppose the only thing I can say about whatever's going on with the FAI and but the last few years when I was with them, I loved it. I thought there a lot of good people there. Obviously, there's stuff going on now that I probably haven't got a clue about. But I love my time there, some really good people, some good staff. I know there's people in the background, you know, um, genuine football and people. Whatever we say, football's a great game. Um, so I've, I've kind of stepped back. I've had my time there. There's no point in me getting involved, I suppose, in the politics of it. Um, but you hope they get through, and I'm sure they will. And everyone can learn from it, because, you know, you know, nobody's perfect. Uh, to wrap up, I will be here pretty much all night. Um, you said there stuff doesn't keep you up nice. You referenced Saipan earlier, not getting into a he said, he said kind of thing. Does that cross your mind? You know, you mentioned you think of Cork every day. Would that cross your mind often at this stage? Is it still raw? What, what could have happened or might have happened? That kind of, I no, guess. What, not really, no. I, um, again, I think it's important. People look at, if, if people look at the facts, people don't need to do facts. The bottom line, you're on about management, man management, dealing with players. If a manager is going to step up in front of a, a group of players and staff, um, and make, make accusations against any player, whether it be me or Robbie or Duffer or whoever it was, there's going to be trouble. Sure. There, there is. You're on about management and getting a group together. And again, I don't know how many games we played to qualify for the World Cup. Somebody might tell me in the audience or Google it or whatever. I think it might have been with the playoff games. I think it was out of 12 or 14. I think it was. How many? 14. 14, right. I think I missed one match. Yeah, Thanks. I think I missed. Playoff. Thanks, Mick. <laughs> I, um... <laughs> oh, no. I think I missed one match. I think I did. Somebody might put me. I think I missed one match. And then on the eve of the World Cup, there's a meeting with all the players. Now, forget the kit and all that. That was all sorted out. I'm sick of repeating myself with all that stuff. That bit. And you're sitting with a group of players. You're flying on the next day to your official train, and there's a meeting called in front of everybody. And there's accusations made against me about missing one game in the whole campaign. You know, what are you expecting? No, I, totally. It's such a loss for you to give up on that World Cup. Do you, does any party ever think, oh, I should have played that World Cup and then just got the well, hell out of there? There's a situation that I wish hadn't kind of panned out that way, of course. But again, I know it takes two to tango and I have to look at my own part, of course. But I just think, well, again, I honestly, but like the United stuff, what was I supposed to say? You know, I've, I've missed, I've, I missed one game and the medical staff were involved and making this accusation against me in front of, but even if he again pulled me one to sure. one and this was on the EV of the World Cup it wasn't three months earlier or three months later we're flying out tomorrow and you put in front of all the group please tell me whatever there's people in there who run businesses I'd love to think what do you think was going to happen when you make accusations yeah. against I suppose a character like me whether it be a senior player a cat forget about the captaincy I think if I was sitting there and mixed it up and made accusations against and any of the other players I'd be going oh where are you going with this well, you know, we're flying out tomorrow. What, what, what hang-ups have you got about all this carry-on? Yeah. So, yeah, no, I don't, that doesn't keep me awake. I think I was fortunate enough, again, I'd, I'd obviously played in the 94 World Cup. I've experienced the World Cup. I had a taste of it. Um, and I, I, I kind of don't think the baggage from Saipan, I don't really carry it around with me. Okay. I think other people should carry it around with them, not me. Did you carry it around with you for a couple of years? Did it take a long time, a couple of years to kind of dissolve away a bit? Um, yeah, I suppose there would have been, a, again, I suppose the word I'd use, there would have been a lot, a lot, of, um, a lot of anger, I suppose, afterwards. Okay. Especially then afterwards, again, the usual spin-offs that come out of it. He said this, he said that, did it. Again, people getting sidetracked, I suppose, yeah. and getting brainwashed. But again, if all people have to do is look at the facts. Look at the facts. And that's it. And, I, and I'm comfortable with that. Again, I... I Again, if it was any other player, I'd be sitting there going, whoa, whoa, where's this going? Like Gary was saying, he was looking at the meeting with me and the manager and all the other... And you're looking sometimes, and that's where you hope sometimes people go, oh, put a stop to this. But it was as soon as Mick started it, and I'm sure Mick would sit here and give his own. Sure. Of course he would. 
But for the players who were in there, and I know players have all kind of taped all around it, I wish one or two of the players would say something like, well, you did make an accusation against the player. <laughs> what was going to happen? Yeah. I just said, no, Mick, I think you're wrong there, but I'll see you in the morning on the flight, you know. <laughs> yeah. Pretzel manger. And there was no, like... <laughs> <laughs> at, at that stage, there's no chance of you going, well, we should talk about this privately. It's just like, you can't, you just see, no, see red I, of it. Again, I think if Mick or one of the other senior players are interrupted, but then there's an environment, again, I, I, I can't be criticised other people in the room, um, because they probably, I think they probably would have been shocked by all of it as well. Yeah. Because again, it was, a, strange enough, it was kind of, um, the evening we had after a week, from getting over there with all the trouble with the gear. We kind of obviously got through all that, like you do as a team, a bit like United, you have difficult spells, yeah. businesses, people fall out, but you kind of eventually get through it and you go, yeah, listen, we're, we're, the, we're better for that. But when this took off, you're looking going, hey, uh, is someone going to interrupt this? And, and I think people, again, were, I, I think there would have been certain players there when, well, I don't, I don't really want to get, and I understand that as well. I don't, again, I, I don't think people should all step in. Yeah. They're probably saying, well, as long as I'm okay and I'm, I'm going to play in the World Cup, I understood all that. Yeah. Even the next morning, they're all leaving. And, uh, and I definitely think I certainly had a different relationship, no doubt in my mind, with the Irish players than I had with my United teammates who were day-to-day -day stuff. And a lot of the lads I played with Ireland over a number of years, I never really got to know them. And I, I, was kind of, I suppose I wasn't really kind of that important to them. Because when we used to know for Ireland, particularly in the early days, you'd obviously come in on a kind of Monday morning, the game was the Wednesday. So you'd leave after some international trips going, I didn't really speak to anybody in that yeah. sense, because you got training, you go back to your room. So I didn't have this kind of bond with the Irish players that probably thought might. And I had to remind myself when I was playing for Ireland what the game was all about, particularly at senior level. And people would sometimes question my character. He was a bit moody or resistant, which was all nonsense. I was there to win. I wasn't there to be pals with everybody. And I think that at the end when it kind of backfired, nobody was going to come up to my room and go, please come back, Roy. They were like, you know, if you're off, you're off. There's a selfish side to, to football as well. But then again, I think with my traits, as much as I knock myself, I've also played with captains, Kenny Cunningham, these people, who were obsessed with being popular and kind of pals with everybody and obsessed with the media. You're going, yeah, but you're not going to try and win the game. No, no, I'll just try and be pals with everybody. <laughs> you're not for me either. <laughs> you want your captains and leaders to be whatever's going on with them going, but I think they might help us to win the game on Saturday. So, um, but I won't get started on him. <laughs> Yeah, I'm he, sure Kenny would defend himself. Yeah, he, and will. He, um, you, you know, it blows up and you go home, and it's this unbelievably huge story. Like here, I'm sure you got word of how big it was, and you're out and you're walking the dog, and or then you're doing the RTE interview, <laughs> and there's like a steel about you. There's no doubts. Just this front of someone. Did you, when you close the door behind you, and you're in the midst of something like that, are you stressed? Or are you thinking, oh my God, this is, I'm, this is mad. No, you, you, you. I think the, the, the stress and all the worry comes for your, your, the rest of your family, really. Because right. I kind of knew, I, I was at the meeting, I knew what was said towards me, whereas other people were getting different stories, and he said that, and, he, and I'm pretty, well, I know, obviously, it would have been hard for my family in Cork. I know that for a fact, of course. Put it this way, if, if my son was now playing for, for Ireland, and he went on a journey and played a lot of games, then missed out on a tour, I know I'd be upset, even if he was saying, no, it's, I, I can deal with it. I go, I know, but as a, as a parent. Yeah, yeah. So I think my family would have suffered a lot more than me because I knew what was going on and I knew I kind of, I keep saying I had to fight my corner. You do in life, sometimes situations come up where you, and I, I roll with a lot of stuff. You know, I, sometimes I go, I just, I go with this. I'm not going to, but there's other times when people look you in the eye and you go, no, nah, no, nah, I, I can't accept that. And I think that's, that's the way it is. Funny you mentioned that uh, your daughter is here tonight and they're all at an age now, I guess, where they're very much fully aware of your career and all the success you had. Did you go through a process with them where like, they're asking you, what happened there? No, they've never really brought it up, I'll be honest. Well, I've got, I've got four daughters, so the girl, girls are too busy with their makeup and stuff, so they wouldn't be... <laughs> well, no, I mean that in a nice way. You know, I, I, Kind of soccer's down yeah, there. They've, like got, anything. they've got the Kardashians, they've got the hair, they've got you know, all these programs, Love Island. That's their priority, not, not necessarily my career. And they were, they were at a young age where they didn't have to take it too seriously. So my family have never, I never kind of took my career or my football, I suppose, in a sense. Kind of, it sounds strange, this. I think if you ever came to my house, you wouldn't think I'd been involved in sport or football. It was, I kind of always kept my family a bit distanced from it. They never really came to, they never really came to many matches. And I kind of enjoyed that because I also think when you're playing sport, maybe Gary will agree, 
you're kind of like an actor. You know, you are like an actor. You saw a picture up there, I had a skinhead, and you're going, again, I always thought when I was going to play football, I was going to, go into, I was going to war. So I was fighting my corner, my livelihood. I wanted my family to have a good life, contract. I want my mum and dad to be good. And so you're fighting. You're like, so don't get distracted by all the kind of, and that's why a little bit when we were deported, we united all the families were involved. I remember thinking, oh, keep the families. It's great if you win something, get them involved. But this is, this is serious stuff. I've took football very seriously since I was eight years of age. I have. I've just been obsessed with it and trying to win. Maybe too much, I don't know. So with my, with, I think my kids have always... They can't, I remember, you're on about loyalty with your kids and family. I remember saying to them, I never go, do you want to come to the game? They go, no, we're busy. But I think they came one time to a match at Ipswich. And, um, I know, Ipswich, they did. They came and they left, I think, after 40 minutes. <laughs> I, I think we were 2-0 down. <laughs> and I, remember, I, I remember I got, I got home and I went, oh, what's the thing of the game? They went, no, we left, it was freezing. <laughs> so, um, so that was their kind of loyalty towards me at Ipswich. <laughs> Gary, do you think everything you've listened to for the last 20 minutes, half an hour, do you look from the outside with our obsession, this country's obsession with Roy and talking about Roy? Do you find it all a bit insane? It's not hugely um, surprising, actually, to be fair. Probably around 98, similar type of thing with David Beckham in 96 with Gaza. You think of the way in which Gaza was sort of five, six years, that obsession with sort of one figure, David Beckham, then the same. Wayne Rooney's had it in previous years. I think the country, um, it happens in other countries. <clears throat> um, obviously, you know, Roy's hugely um, popular in Ireland and sort of a huge figure. Um, so, you know, I, I understand it because ultimately I sort of lived it um, with other players, with England. You know, it was a, the scrutiny on... The scrutiny on players like Roy, like David Beckham, like Wayne Rooney, like you know, Paul Gascoigne in 96 when he was a sort of superstar, is huge. It's absolutely huge. They're judged all the time without, you know, judged by people essentially, as Roy just said, that don't know them, um, that don't understand them. And just, if you like, it's like I, think, I think the Charlotte's Ferguson hair dry one is the, probably the best analogy. Um, it doesn't describe the person of Sir Alex Ferguson. Um, the idea that, you know, Roy um, was in the changing room sort of, you know, ranting at us is 0.5% of the time. You know, the 99.5% of the time was humour, um, thought, quiet actually. Some, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the noisiest in the dressing room. So you had people like David May in there and, you know, some of the younger lads who were really sort of boisterous all the time. So you think about the fact that um, considered, you know, always think of having a cup of tea with Dennis. He's one of the only people in. <laughs> you know, a bit Dennis Sharwin, by the way. <laughs> no, but it's like you know, the only, I think the only two people in the dressing room. I can have a cup of tea. Like, <laughs> you know, Barry, it's like no, my, my, nan, my, cup, my nan has a cup of tea. You know what I mean? <laughs> But that, that, that was it, you know, they, they, they roomed together, they were both quiet. And then Roy obviously was a huge character, you know, came alive on the pitch, came alive in training. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he had, he had boundaries. He had boundaries. And to be fair, you had to, I think, my view on it was that, I think the, the five or six young lads in the team, we got to know the boundaries quickly and early. And that's an understanding and awareness of the players that you're playing with. It's an understanding of where you could, you know, Nicky Butt had different boundaries than Paul Scholes, than, than Ryan Giggs, than Roy Keane. You had to understand the different characters within the team. You had to understand what sort of made them tick. And I think the most important thing is you had to be tolerant of each other. You had to be tolerant of each other in the dressing room. Everybody was different. And if you overstepped the boundary, not just with Roy, but with other players, it was going to be a problem. And there were times in the dressing room where I knew, you know, when he said before he was on the list and he joked, and he, there were times when we knew, as you know, the lads, me, gigs, his skulls, you know, played with him for five, six. We knew when someone was sort of just, yeah, just like a woodpecker. <laughs> we knew when someone was just sort of, because, you know, there was either something that he'd seen that he didn't like, something that he'd smelt, something that, but we knew that smell, we knew that scent, we knew that, same with the manager. We, I, I don't think I ever, after three, four years of playing in the first team, I never, I never was surprised by when he came in at half time and had to go to a certain player. I knew it was going to happen. You just, you just got to know them. And I think my view on it was that 
there were times where you thought, oh, well, you've overstepped the mark there. I think he particularly did once with me at Coventry. I'm very disappointed. Um, <laughs> and actually, it's the only time he's ever come up to me, only aggressively, you know, he came up to me like, you know, proper, you know, proper angry. And with I just, me? yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd just taken an extra touch. <laughs> <laughs> He wanted the Fair cross enough. in first time. <laughs> and I just thought I might take a touch before I put it in. It's honestly oh, true. No. But I remember turning round to him. You know, he's, anyway, his, first, his first statement to me was, cross the fucking ball first time. And I remember saying, fuck off. Hmm. Which you know, wasn't particularly well taken. <laughs> no respect. <laughs> and, he was and, the instigator. No, no respect. And to what fair, he I knew that I was going to have a problem at half time. Yeah. <laughs> but then you know something? On the Monday morning, I went up to see him. You might not, you probably won't even remember. One thing that I always thought that it was a problem was if you let things fester yeah. with Roy, particularly, you know what I mean? If, if it went one day without speaking to him, then two days, then three days, then four days, I saw players do this. And I used to say, to, you know, if that, that happened, I used to say, just go and speak. Just go and speak. <laughs> and I remember going up to speak to him on the Monday and it was fine. But I think, because I think, you know, as a younger player, and I was a younger player at the time, probably 22, 23. You either let it fester and then it evolved into something that was bigger than it actually was, or you dealt with it there and then. And I think, you know, you had a similar situation with Giggsy, I think, at one point, and maybe other players where there were moments where... I actually remember once getting in one morning, actually, to be fair, we were probably the first in in the morning, like eight o'clock or something like that. I remember him and Giggsy started an argument about eight o'clock, and I was listening to it thinking, oh, this is not great. <laughs> okay, I'll, go, I'll go get my breakfast. I think it came down about 27 minutes past eight, and they were still going. And I thought, oh, this is not going to go. But then they, they sorted it out after a couple of months or so. You know what I mean? It's, it's, oh, a couple of weeks. <laughs> 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 no, but you know what I mean? There were moments yeah, yeah. that happened like that. But then there were certain players who didn't sort of, you know, that didn't, you know, it just, it, it, it festered on and it moved on. It wasn't just Roy, by the way. There was other, yeah, exactly, other yeah. relationships in the dressing room where this happened. You know, Andy Cole and Teddy Sheringham and... You know, there were other relationships like this in the dressing room that you knew that the rest of the players, you just had to manage it, but it was usually because of lack of understanding, tolerance or awareness of where the boundaries were of each person. That's, that's essentially what it was. Um, and I, you know, I personally, from a point of view, never had a problem with it. Um, in fact, like I said before, I just looked to make it quite simply. I never chose the teammates that I was in the dressing room with, but knew that I had to. I felt as though I had to get on with every. I felt as though I had to get on with every player. I, I, I was that type of person that I felt as though I needed to, you know, not, not be friends. I was not friends with any of them. I didn't, you know, other than the lads that you know I was with. I wouldn't go out for a drink with any of them. The other lads that weren't sort of like say, Phil or Bex or Scalzi or everything like that. But I felt as though there had to be that sort of because I think in difficult moments, you know, in in seasons. I, I did think the spirit was unbelievable. Our nights out were unbelievable when they happened. They were amazing. Christmas party or the night in pre-season or the night when we won the league. For me, people say what were the best moments were in my career were those moments. They're the things I miss, actually. They're the things I miss. I actually don't miss the football. I don't miss being in the change room. I don't miss the training. I do miss those moments of camaraderie of where basically you're all going out together, you're having a good time, you're enjoying yourself, you've won a trophy or you're basically a Christmas party. Or, I do miss those moments. Roy would probably say something different. He might not miss those moments, I, but I, I did. I felt that to me that I felt sometimes in pre-season we go out on a night out and the team would come together and have the most unbelievable night. The spirit the day after in training, the day after that was incredible. Mm. And I just thought, you know something, you can't beat that. I knew we were unbeatable because I knew full well we'd seen everything of each other, you know, falling over or being sick or whatever it was. You know, no, and it was me as well, by the way. No, it's true. No, I, I, I remember once, to be fair, I think it was 18, 19, uh, outside the Golden Rice Bowl on, the, on um, Cross Street in Manchester, lying down on the floor being sick. And I remember, to be fair, Bex and Ben Thorne and Chris Casper getting me home. And those things you think, but there were moments where you came together and you could tell those stories of each other for the next... You lived off those stories for the next two months in the dressing room with each other. That coming together of people whereby you just... Um, and that's what made us... Not what made us unbeatable. The football made us unbeatable. But I miss those moments, to be fair. And from a point of view of Roy, sort of, the last 25 minutes, I've listened to this a lot of this today. You know, he's told me a lot of stories today that I find 
compelling, just compelling to listen to. He told me a story about Matty Taylor, trying to sign Matty Taylor for Sunderland. I thought it was amazing. I was laughing. I need to tell, I think you need to tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was amazing, you know what I mean? I thought it was absolutely amazing, but he's actually, <laughs> you're talking about his experiences in management where, you know, and I, I, similar experiences to be fair, myself at Valencia and with England, and you just think, incredible experiences. I, I don't recognize sometimes, to be fair, the, um, the description of Roy Keane or David Beckham or Wayne Rooney. I don't, I don't recognize it actually sometimes. I don't recognize the actual description of them. Um, I know there are moments where they may have done an individual thing, but actually from a point of view of the 99.9% .9 of the time that I was with them during a football career, it isn't them. It isn't them as people. You know, Roy at home would be completely different than Roy maybe in the change room or Roy on the pitch or same with all of us. Um, and the scrutiny on these individuals is because they were the best players, the most famous players, the players who had the best story. You go back to George Best, you go back to all the players who've had great careers. They're the, they're the best players. They're the best players and they're playing for the biggest club. A club, that everyone, no, a club that has an obsession in Dublin, in Cork, in Thailand, in Singapore, in Manchester, in London, everywhere. That's why Paul Pogba now is the obsession. Because he's the biggest player at the biggest club, he's a World Cup winner, and it should be a compliment that people are talking about him. I don't see it. When I criticise Paul Pogba, when I, when I criticise Paul Pogba after the penalty incident at Wolves, I don't see it as being any different than the criticism of, say, Roy Keane or David Beckham or Wayne Rooney. The best player, the leader, the captain in the team will stand up and he will take the brunt of the criticism, just as the manager will and the coach will. It won't be the assistant coach, it won't be the left winger or the right back or the left back, it'll be the player who is the number one player in the team. And that's never changed. It's not a, it's not, you know, I'm sure Paul Pogba, you know, I, I, I speak to people and apparently he's a great lad, he trains well, he, you know, he wants, to, you know, he's a really good person. I actually was at the club with him when he was a young lad. So when people criticise him or put the pressure on him or apply the pressure on him, it's because he's the best. He's the, he's the shining light. He's the Brian Robson of the 80s now. United are in trouble. People hung everything off Brian Robson. Everything, everybody now hangs a lot off Paul Pogba. But that's the pressure that he wants. He wants to be the best player in the world. So now, go and show us that you're the best player in the world. Carry this team, which is young, inexperienced, hasn't got the, best, the most know-how, needs leaders and characters on the pitch. And I said two weeks ago, to be fair, on television, wouldn't it be great if he thought of himself as being the player of the year this year? The player of the year. What does he need to do that? Carry Manchester United into the Champions League, win the Europa League, drive them forward, take it as your responsibility here at this club for 12 months, and you're going to be the best player in the league and one of the best players in the world. That's what I want from Paul Pogba. That's what I want from him, because I think he's capable of doing it. I think he's capable of doing it. I have faith in him to do it. But then I see an incident like Wolves, and that disappoints me. That disappoints me. So I, I, he, has to, he has to take the criticism for that. We've got to wrap this up, unfortunately. We've been way over time. We're what going about to give the Matty away Taylor a, story? Is it worth it, Roy? Well, Matty Taylor? <laughs> Let me do that Matty Taylor story. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> set me up for the fall, yeah. <laughs> it probably won't good. be as funny here as it was on the flight this morning. Um, up at Sunderland, blah, blah, blah. Trying to get players up to Sunderland, always difficult. Their wives didn't want to go up there because they want to go shopping. They did it. Eventually get Matty Taylor up. He was leaving, I think, Portsmouth. And he, he had an opportunity, I think, to go to Sunderland or Bolton. So I met him at the, uh, the stadium, up at the boardroom, gave him all the, the talk for about an hour or two. He said, I've got a lot to think about, it's a big decision. I said, course, you take your time, huge decision, I'll walk you down to the car park. As we walked down, he says, listen, Roy, huge decision, thanks for the chat. He says, yeah, you take your time, big decision, I understand for your family, no problem. Bolton, Sunderland to Bolton is no comparison, but listen, Bolton were not a bad team at the time. I see him walking to his car, he says, listen, brilliant, thanks for coming up. I'm literally, he turned his back, I got a text, 
text. There's not many people text me. So I said, uh, I write Maddie Taylor. So, right. <laughs> I've got, I've got my phone. I think it was a Blackberry at the time they were in, and I went, uh, <laughs> I can see him getting his car. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, I've decided to go to Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waving him going out the car. <laughs> <laughs> 